Okay, so we're going to go into less detail um, in terms of, you know, drawing things out with the lumbosacral plexus and roots. Okay, so we're going to emphasize here the clinical aspect in terms of how to use the exam here to localize the lesion. So just like with the upper extremity with roots and plexus, we're going to use the same three components of the neurologic examination to diagnose problems here. Motor, sensory, and reflexes. And so the motor is the hardest part, right? Because there are quite a few muscles to know. But the sensory distribution, the dermatomes, and the reflexes, uh, make sure you get those down. That will help you figure out a lot of things and then begin to work on incorporating um, the muscles into this. All right, so we're first going to start here with um, L234 nerve roots, which clinically I'm not going to ask you to distinguish between an L234 radiculopathy and a lumbar plexopathy. That's really hard, and frequently we need a test called an EMG. We need neuroimaging studies. So we're going to kind of lump these two together. And we're going to also lump together the L5 nerve roots and the S1 nerve roots as the sacral plexus. Okay, but it would be really important here because the probably the most common board question and the most common thing clinically we see from this whole lecture is an S1 radiculopathy. So you need to know that one really well. Okay, and also L5 radiculopathies are very common. So make sure you can separate between an L5 and an S1 uh, root lesion. All right, so let's go over L234 and the lumbar pl plexus. So we have three muscles here that are very helpful to evaluate uh, the anatomy here. The iliacus, which kind of comes right off the lumbar plexus, um, is for hip flexion, quadriceps, of course, knee extension, femoral nerve, and there's several adductor muscles, of course. I just put adductor longus here, the bringing the knees together. All of these are good L234 lumbar plexus and you know, different nerves that come off um, in that area. And so the drawing here, a medical student spent a long time kind of working on this. It is not anatomically correct, all right, but it's kind of to just give you a big picture of um, the anatomy here and where things come from. So we have L234 nerve roots, and if you want, you know, these nerve roots here kind of become the lumbar plexus. So we can kind of put the lumbar plexus here in this area. Again, this is not drawn to scale or anything like that. Uh, we will come back to a very, very important nerve here just because it's damaged so commonly called the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Okay, we'll see that supply is the lateral thigh. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so from the L234 nerve roots and plexus, we have the nerve to iliacus. So again, we're going to check that. We do that on our routine examination. Every patient we see in neurology, we have them lift up the knee. Okay, so we're checking L234, lumbar plexus, and the branch here to the iliacus. And then, of course, we have the femoral and obturator nerves. So the femoral nerve, um, among other things, supplies quadriceps, of course, and then the obturator for the thigh adductors. And I will just point out here that the saphenous nerve supplies the medial calf. And so when we're thinking about the dermatomal distribution, this is really helpful to know that the, really this is the L4 sensory fibers here that go down to the medial calf area. Okay, that's the only dermatome um, in terms of L234 lumbar plexus that's below the knee. Okay, medial calf. Now the uh, sacral plexus here clinically, we're going to just talk about L5, S1, a little S2. There's a tiny contribution from the L4 nerve root down to uh, a single muscle, but it's probably not that uh, significant um, as we'll see. So again, L5 and S1 root lesions, we want to be able to distinguish those clinically. Okay, so um, again, sacral plexus here in this area, and then we've got some branches here. The superior gluteal nerve supplies gluteus medius, inferior gluteal nerve supplies uh, gluteus maximus, and the root distribution here is very different. So if you want to just write it down on this drawing, gluteus medius is almost exclusively an L5 muscle. 
a little S1, but it's almost, it's mainly L5, whereas gluteus maximus is almost exclusively an S1 muscle. So again, when we're thinking about separating L5 and S1 radiculopathies, being able to assess these two muscles will really help us. Okay, and then of course we have the sciatic nerve and the tibial nerve, and neurologists really have a hard time with the new terminology, the fibular nerve, because we've called it for years the perineal nerve, but so I'll probably say both every time I talk about the perineal and the fibular nerve. And then we have a superficial and a deep um, branch. All right, so let's first start with L234 and the lumbar plexus. All right, so here's just another drawing here in, in uh, uh, purple, I guess. We have things coming off from the lumbar uh, roots. So here's the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, okay, which again we'll come back to. But off of the lumbar plexus and L234 nerve roots, we have the femoral nerve here and the obturator nerve. Okay, so again, here are the three muscles. Hip flexion, iliacus, knee extension. Okay, so we can check it. You know, patient sitting, you can just have the patient straighten their leg out. So we could do this in any position. And then um, adduction. So the patient's trying to push their legs together. Or if the patient's sitting, you can have them push their knees together while you try to um, pull apart. Okay, so all three of these are for the L234 lumbar plexus. Now the L5 root, which again is part of the sacral plexus, all of these muscles here are just really important. And three of them, these first three here, all have to do with moving the foot. Okay, so as a uh, bird's eye view, L5 radiculopathies are really common and the muscle that is usually quite weak in an L5 radiculopathy is the tibialis anterior. And this is the muscle that dorsiflexes or bends up your foot. All right, so the presentation of an L5 radiculopathy is usually a uh, foot drop from that muscle. Now, remember I said there's a little branch that goes down from L4 to one muscle, and that is the tibialis anterior. So there is a little L4 in tibialis anterior, but I intentionally left it off this table and put it here because it's mainly L5. So I want you to kind of get the predominance of these. So most patients I see that have L234 radiculopathy, I don't see much, if any, weakness down in tibialis anterior. So we mainly want to associate that with L5. Okay, and then we have uh, Two other muscles here that are L5, posterior tibialis and perineus longus, which we'll, we'll see have to do, if, if you're looking at my feet here, posterior tibialis turns the feet in, perineus longus turns the feet out. Okay, so notice L5 does all three of these motions in the feet, dorsiflexion, eversion, and inversion. So if we've got an L5 radiculopathy, we expect to see some weakness in all three of those foot muscles. Okay, then we have gluteus medius, which I'm going to show you a picture of how you examine that. And the hamstrings I have here in both because the hamstrings are a pretty equal L5 and S1 muscles. All right, so let's go over the pictures here. Gluteus medius is hip abduction. All right, so you could check it like this, the patient's lying on their side, but usually we do this just with the patient sitting and we ask them, could you please spread your knees apart? and you push in as they try to spread their legs apart. So that's gluteus medius. And again, the real significance here is it's a very strong L5 muscle. So if we have someone with a foot drop and you're trying to figure out where the problem is, and eventually you will know five things that cause a foot drop in this class. So this is the first one. And so this muscle here is really important. If gluteus medius muscle is weak, you don't want to be putting the lesion all the way down you know, with the fibular or the perineal nerve. It has to be further up. Okay, tibialis anterior, remember, is foot dorsiflexion. So the patient tries to bend up, you push down. Perineus longus is eversion. And later on, we'll, we'll go more into the details of the deep and the superficial branch of the perineal nerve. For now, we're just focused on the 
the root assessment. And then we have the posterior tibialis nerve, which is for inversion of the foot. Okay, hamstrings, um, of course, is for knee flexion. Okay, so you as the examiner try to pull the leg out as the patient pulls back this way. Your student went to Walla Walla. Um, anyway, so that's a good L5, S1 muscle. Okay, and then S1 nerve roots. Remember I told you probably, well, definitely the most common frequent board question on multiple exams through medical school is an S1 radiculopathy. So really you have to know how to check the S1. So yes, you can check hamstrings because there's a lot of S1, but the gluteus maximus is hip extension. So if the patient is lying on their um, stomach, you can have them lift the leg up. More often, I guess in the clinical setting, we'll just have the patient lie down, okay? And then you try to pull the leg up as the patient pushes the leg, the heel down into the bed or into the chair. So either way, um, but it's hip extension. So um, remember here, circle S1. It's predominantly an S1 muscle. That's why I only put it in the S1 table. And then gastrocnemius, of course, um, is plantar flexion. So that's a great um, S1 muscle. So we can have the patient push down or if the patient is standing, you know, we just ask the patient to stand up on your tiptoes. All right, so those are the muscles that uh, we can use to kind of communicate to us about the roots and the plexus in this area. Sensation for L2, 3, 4 and lumbar plexus is basically the thigh around the knee. And remember L4 goes down to the medial calf, um, saphenous nerve. Okay, whereas for the L5 nerve root, it's mainly the lateral leg and into the top of the foot. We'll see, there's a little bit of, a lot of diagrams show the L4 not just going to the medial calf, but extending down to the big toe. It, and it's one of those things like C7 I was talking about, where there's just a little bit of overlap there. Um, S1 is the back of the leg and the bottom of the foot. Okay, of course, you know that the patella reflex is L234 and lumbar plexus. So since, you know, this, these two lectures are all about lower motor neurons, right? So if we've got an L234 radiculopathy or plexopathy, we're going to lose the patella reflex. The Achilles reflex is, of course, uh, gastrocnemius, right, is the muscle that's activated there. So that's going to be absent in an S1 radiculopathy. And just like with the brachial plexus, remember I said it's really unfortunate. We don't have a great C8, T1 um, reflex. In lower extremity, we really don't have a great L5 reflex. Okay, so if someone has an L5 radiculopathy and maybe they have a foot drop, okay, if it's just a pure L5 radiculopathy, your patella reflex will be normal, your Achilles reflex will be normal, but don't let that confuse you. It's still lower motor neuron. Right, we just don't have a reflex to assess that. Now we will try clinically, there's a hamstrings reflex, but it's hard to get in normal people. Okay, so we don't have a reliable L5 reflex. Okay, so again, patella reflex, L234, lumbar plexus, and of course femoral nerve is the immediate pathway here. And then the Achilles, okay, is S1, sacral plexus, and we can follow that all the way down, sciatic nerve and tibial nerve. So any lesion here, of course, would give us an absent um, Achilles reflex as well. I will say that, um, well, let me, let me just make a comment when I get to S1 radiculopathies. Okay, so there are the reflexes. Sensory testing, again, most of the anterior thigh and down to the knee are L2 and L th L3. L4 extends down to the medial calf and really plus or minus into the big toe. I think probably more often L5 is the big toe, but we're not going to make a big you know, difference about that. And again, I think it varies from patient to patient. Some, you know, uh, will have uh, L4 will be big toe and sometimes it will be L5. So not a huge distinguishing thing. It's not like in the upper extremity, the thumb is C6. You can count on that one, right? With the big toe, uh, not so much. 
Okay, so maybe a little more subtlety here in this drawing. L2 tends to be more anterior thigh. L3 is pretty consistently around the knee. Again, L4 is the medial calf. And in this drawing, uh, the big toe is not L4. Okay, L5 is the lateral leg and down to the dorsum of the foot. And S1, um, this doesn't really show you here, just showing you the more distal part, but it's the back of the leg and the plantar surface of the foot. So lumbar plexus would be lumping all three of these together, right? So it's L2, L3, L4. And the lumbosacral plexus, uh, really this drawing should have the S1 going all the way up here. I'm sorry we didn't draw that correctly here, but the uh, uh, sacral plexus would in, uh, involve the S1 back of the leg and down to the bottom of the foot. Okay, so um, just like with cervical radiculopathies, lumbosacral radiculopathies are painful, back pain, shooting pain down the leg, numbness and tingling, and again, ask the patient, where's the numbness? And many patients have a hard time you know, kind of localizing that. And so just, you know, ask the patient, give me a big picture. Is it more the back of the leg, the front of the leg, the side of the leg? What part of the foot is numb? Is it the top of the foot, the bottom of the foot? And so just from the history, you can begin to think about what root might be affected. And then of course, you need to understand the muscles to then examine the patient and figure out uh, where the problem is. And again, where the problem is, is really important. If it's root, well, we're gonna need to image need an MRI of the spine to see the roots. If we think it's further out in the plexus, then we're gonna order a different test. So localizing really does matter, um, you know, in terms of the testing that you're going to do. Oh, I did just wanna say one thing here. Um, of course, the sciatic nerve, um, th there's a term sciatica, you know, where patients describe pain that goes down the back of the leg. And just so you know, as a big picture, we will talk about the sciatic nerve later. Sciatic neuropathies are um, extremely rare. All right, so I did a neuromuscular fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic and for a whole year just saw patients with peripheral nerve problems and saw two sciatic neuropathies the entire year. And you know, every week you'd see an S1 radiculopathy, right? So if someone has pain going down to the back of the leg, if we're just thinking what is common, always go with S1 nerve root, okay? It's hard to damage the sciatic nerve, okay? Did you have a hand up back there? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, uh, the question is, will you always have motor, sensory, and reflexes? Um, generally, yes. But remember that the roots, sensory and motor, do c enter and exit the spinal cord at different, they, they separate. And so if we had a small disc herniation, you could just involve the sensory fibers. And so someone could have shooting pain down the back of the leg, numbness down the back of the leg. But if it's just the dorsal root, they wouldn't have weakness. And that can happen. But generally, you're gonna have all three affected together. Okay, so remember that um, spinal cord ends around L1 in adults, and then you have the nerve roots, the cauda equina, that have to travel a long distance. I mean, those L5 and S1 nerve roots travel a long ways to get to the appropriate neural foramen to exit. And um, so we can have a lesion like a disc herniation or anything that can compress the cauda equina. So there we're getting lots of nerve roots Okay, so this is cauda equina syndrome. And so um, here we're gonna have bilateral symptoms. You know, if you compress the cauda equina, you can have patients with radicular pain now into both legs, numbness and weakness in both legs. Um, generally here, if we affect the cauda equina, you're also gonna get those sacral fibers, which would be uh, very important for bowel and bladder function. So usually we're gonna have um, incontinence and issues with bowel and bladder which we really don't see with just a pure L5 or an S1 radiculopathy. So this would push us more in the cauda equina direction and just kind of tie bowel and bladder together with sexual, normal sexual function as well. So 
uh, in men with Cotaquina syndrome, difficulty having an erection, for example, would kind of go along with that. And then saddle anesthesia. Remember I mentioned we have with Cotaquina, usually the sacral nerve roots are affected. So the S345 dermatomes, we're going to get this saddle anesthesia. So if you see that, again, we're pretty primed for um, Cotaquina syndrome. Okay, now when I went through the UWorld questions um, um, some time ago, and I know about 450 or so neuropathology questions, and there were two of them that asked you to separate Cotaquina syndrome from conus medullaris lesion. Remember, the conus medullaris is the tip of the spinal cord, and there's a lot of overlap. So I thought these were fairly difficult questions, and so I've included a little bit here so that when you come to them, hopefully you'll get them right. So a lot of overlap. They're both going to have a lot of this uh, potentially saddle anesthesia, so don't use that as a distinguishing feature. So probably the biggest thing is, th with the conus medullaris, we're still in the spinal cord, right? We still have upper motor neurons. And so if there's anything at all that is upper motor neuron, Babinski, maybe a little clonus, the lesion cannot be uh, in the cotaquina. Because remember, the cotaquina, those are nerve roots. Nerve roots are lower motor neurons, right? So as a big, big picture, um, cotaquina syndrome, you are only allowed to have lower motor neuron findings, loss of reflexes, atrophy, and so on. If our lesion is a little bit higher up in the conus, now we're going to have something upper motor neuron. So I think that would be the biggest takeaway. Uh, with our lesion at the tip of the conus, we mainly get the sacral um, cord. And so, you know, we're still going to have this kind of sensory finding. Remember, radiculopathies are painful. If you pinch a nerve root, it's electrical, it's shooting. Um, a compressive lesion in the conus is much less painful, okay? Also, you know, just think of the tip of the conus. If you've got a lesion there, typically we're going to have perfectly symmetrical findings um, going down on both sides. Okay, cotaquina lesions tend to be, and you know, we've got these nerve roots kind of all over the place, and so we tend to get more asymmetrical findings. And the bowel and bladder, and I should add here, sexual dysfunction in conus medullaris lesions is even worse than what we see in cotaquina syndrome. That wouldn't be a great distinguishing feature. So biggest one is anything upper motor neuron, don't go for cotaquina, go for conus. Okay, and probably the less pain and the symmetry would be um, helpful as well. Okay, let's talk about a few uh, specific things um, here that can involve the plexus. And really, there's only one that um, I've highlighted here for you uh, to know, just because this is such an important one uh, clinically that you just recognize it. So retroperitoneal hemorrhage will be our example of a lumbar uh, plexus lesion. So remember, the lumbar plexus is here, and so we've already said our weakness is going to be hip flexion to iliacus, quadriceps, and thigh adduction. Okay, and the story here with a retroperitoneal hemorrhage is a patient who's on a, a blood thinner. Okay, like, um, have you learned about heparin yet? Yeah, so um, usually these patients are admitted uh, and they need to be put on a blood thinner. And a spontaneous hemorrhage in the retroperitoneal area can occur in patients especially that are on heparin, okay? And blood tends to sink right down into the retroperitoneal area. And if you remember from anatomy, the lumbar plexus is kind of formed right in the psoas muscle there. So the hematoma goes right down to the lumbar plexus. And so this is a lumbar uh, plexopathy, okay? And so patients, again, it's, we're affecting the, the plexus here, so just like with a root lesion, anytime you pinch a peripheral nerve, it's very painful. So we're going to have back pain, shooting pain down the leg. Uh, they're going to have weakness of those three muscles, okay, iliacus, quadriceps, adductors. They're going to have sensory loss in the thigh, knee, and down to the medial calf. They're going to have an absent patellar reflex, okay, off of the femoral nerve here. And so just clinically, 
Um, this is indistinguishable from an L234 radiculopathy, right? You couldn't tell. But the story, patient's on a blood thinner, right? So that tells us that um, uh, this is a plexus lesion. Frequently it's the story, again, just like a, an infant that's born with a waiter's tip position. You couldn't do an exam to figure out that that's whether at C5-6 or superior trunk, but it's a story tells you, you know that from the story that it has to be a superior trunk. So if we have a retroperitoneal hemorrhage here, um, and if you've heard about this, you recognize it, then the first thing you just do is stop the heparin, right? Because you don't want to keep the bleeding to persist. And then um, when we get to neuroradiology, we'll say that uh, CT is such a great test for acute hemorrhage. So do a CT scan of the pelvis, you'll pick up that hematoma. And then the blood usually resolves pretty quickly, um, reabsorbs, and the patient comes back to normal. Okay, so the, the I've seen a few where people just weren't aware of this. Oh, the patient's having back pain, probably just tired of lying in bed. And um, then that hematoma can really grow and it can be a significant issue. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanted to go over is something exceptionally common um, here where it's not real this is not really a, a plexus or a root issue I'm just looking for an excuse to put this somewhere in the curriculum and that is damage to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve so this is L23 and this is a pure sensory nerve so it doesn't supply any muscles and this just gets an area of your lateral thigh okay like right here all right and so the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve goes through the lateral groin area. And so this is usually compressed in the groin by people that wear tight fitting clothing, belts, um, especially if that individual is overweight. And so I've seen this in several police officers or people that wear tight belts for their job or just their pants are too tight, okay? And they come in complaining of maybe a burning pain out here in the lateral thigh, okay? And so the question, in fact, oftentimes the referral is, could this patient have a lumbar radiculopathy, like an L2, L3 radiculopathy, okay? And so if you remember that the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is only sensory, has nothing to do with movement, then you'll remember that the patient is not allowed to have any weakness, okay? If you're finding weakness of the quadriceps reflex or the thigh adductors, well now it can't be lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy, right? So they're not allowed to have weakness and since this is a pure sensory nerve, has nothing to do with supplying the quadriceps with motor function, um, reflexes are normal, okay? And so um, I worked with a neurologist for years and we s would see so many of these patients and he told me once, give me five seconds uh, with a patient that has lateral thigh numbness, and I'll tell you what they have. And his point was, if you just allow me to check reflexes, I'll tell you. If they're symmetrical, they're normal, it's lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy. If it's absent, then it's going to be a lumbar radiculopathy. All right, um, so I'm going to go over some questions, but let me just stop there and just uh, see if you have any questions on what we went over here this morning. Yes? Uh-huh. No, I'm sorry, because uh, I was just pulling. So you, you were saying about a retroperitoneal hemorrhage? Yeah. So typically the perineal nerve will uh, not be affected in that because that's L5, S1. There's that, remember I mentioned a tiny contribution that goes down to tibialis anterior, but that that's not, you know, real significant. 